do you think the world would be better off with or without organized religion? Because there's a lot of wars from it, but also it makes people really happy and gives them hope. I want to get your opinion on the U.S. involvement in the world and how we try to stay out of it. Like, they want us to stay out of it. But since we got so involved in the past, or even now when we try getting non-involved, that we get drawn back in. Tuesday's lecture, you were pretty adamant against the use of the word genocide. Do you think our intervention or any other country's intervention in that conflict would help if they were fighting for peace? Yeah. Because uh, I guess if it's one thing I've learned, um, it seems like peace is the only option in these conflicts between both sides and accepting that you kind of have to move on. What are your thoughts on like loneliness being such an epidemic with that and can social media do anything to change that? Uh, do you think your generation owes our generation an apology or <laughs> vice versa? <laughs> for what? Wait, for what? I had a question after watching the video on Afghanistan last night. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's crackdown on women. None of these stories are getting out. The Taliban beat anyone caught filming something they don't like. And me and my roommate were actually talking about it for a really long time. And I just wanted to see your opinion on it from a sociological perspective. Do you think the world would be better off with or without organized religion? Because there's a lot of wars from it, but also it makes people really happy and gives them hope. If we don't have organized religion, we have other thought systems that are organized, okay? So it doesn't really matter that it's religion or it's something else or it's political ideology or social ideology. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? The, the only thing that's different with religion is that people who organize their religion around the idea that, that there is some kind of God, supreme being or beings, multiple beings, because some religions are polytheistic, and that, that God is on their side, right? God told me told us to say this. God told us to act in this way. God told us to believe these things. And so when you have God on your side, you can do a lot of things that, are, that you wouldn't normally do if you didn't think God was on your side, okay? So organizing a thought system around a God, that belief, is, has, it's a little bit more presumptuous and, and gives a little bit more flexibility to do both good things and bad things than if you organize your thought system around, I don't know, the golden rule. It's just like, hey, my religion is just do unto others as you want them to do unto you. That's it. There's no God. There's no this. There's no that. Just do that. So that's what I think. So it's not, the, if the world, we didn't have religion, we'd have something else. People say like there are all these horrible things that are done in the name of religion or because of religion. Well, there are horrible things that are done because of a lot of things and religion's generally never a part of it. It's just that people, they grab onto their religious belief as a justification for things that they do. Mostly because they think they need it, maybe. Hi, I want to get your opinion on the U.S. involvement in the world and how we try to stay out of it. Like, they want us to stay out of it, but since we got so involved in the past, or even now when we try getting non-involved, that we get drawn back in. One of the reasons that the United States is the, world, the, the superpower that we are, a global superpower, is because we have been very involved all over the world, for good and for bad. There are a lot of pretty, those of you who are really pro-US and have this idea that the US, we do, we're an important superpower, we do really so many good things and so on. Make sure you also know some of the not so good things that we've done and that we do. So we have been very involved. And what that means then is that we're like really, we're committed in so many places. Right? You know, we have something like 400 military bases around the world. I mean, nobody, there's no country in the world that comes close to that, right? So we're, we're committed in that way to be linked with so many different cultures and nations and so on. So, like, so we have to be involved. We're going to be involved. That's just kind of the nature of it, yeah. And it, to a degree, the many places in the world have 
come to expect and rely on that kind of involvement. Sometimes for nefarious reasons, you know, negative reasons, and sometimes for good reasons. Tuesday's lecture, you were pretty adamant against the use of the word genocide. But let me also say to you, dude, genocide is a really strong word. Okay. I wrote down the stages of genocide before I came here. Oh, so no, I, I got that, it. I got that. But just understand that you, as a, as a teacher, yeah. right, there's, there's, there is a, there's certain rhetoric that it's a rhetorical word, right, that you use. And, like, I can make the argument for anything if I, if I go to specific definitions and so on. So I just want to say just you want to be really careful with that. <laughs> What no, word? hang on. I wasn't, I wasn't that adamant against it, but I was like, hey, you got to be really cautious before you use that word. You but said not to use it. I don't think but I what? said don't use it. I think I was just saying, when you use that word, that has certain meaning. you got to understand, that's a I think really it does. powerful word. It is a very powerful yeah. word, and I think, personally, I think it's a fitting word, but if it's not fitting for you in the context of that dispute yet whatever you yeah. want to call it what yeah. would you call it yeah let me just say in in fairness right there are a lot of people who don't apply that word ever who and they only started to apply it in the past 30 days in or two months or three months right and so I'm like hang on a second man do you do you know what the word means you know where it came from you know how it got developed right and it it came out of World War II, and it came out of an understanding. The only way that we can understand what the Nazis were trying to do was to exterminate, completely, absolutely exterminate an entire ancestry group of people, okay? There's, we had no word in the, English, in, the, in, the, in the global lexicon for that, and certainly not in English. And so uh, that's where that word came out of. Okay, the word means an attempt to extinguish from the face of the earth an entire group of people. And that's not what's happening in Gaza. But I understand that it's kind of like using apartheid to discuss the, relation, the political relationship between Palestinians and Jews, apartheid in Israel. Israel is an apartheid state, right? So people make that argument. And I'm like, well, apartheid has, okay, but apartheid has really specific, unique meaning. And I can use it loosely, but if I really want to use that word carefully and what it means and how that, how that really is d definitive of something, then I b wouldn't really use it there. But it's, it's neo, it's apartheid-like, you know, because there are two different, in many, some, in, to some degree, sets of laws for Palestinians and, or for Arabs and Jews, but it's all relative. It's, so anyway, it's like that, but it, that, I don't think it fits for genocide in that way. However, my take on it the other day is like, don't just throw that word out there willy-nilly, man, because that is a, just be really careful about that. That's like a, one of those words. So I'm just, you know, I'm not gonna shut y'all down for saying certain things, but I, I'm just like, be careful about that. Um, from everything we've learned about Gaza, it sounds like both sides, um, are extremely polarized because of how many things they've done to each other. Yeah. Um, but from the video with the history of the coups we've been involved in, it sounds like n people don't necessarily agree with us intervening in these conflicts because we can make it worse for those countries sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like both opposing sides from the class that we had uh, can't necessarily come around to each other because of all the terrible things they've done to each other. Yeah. Do you think our intervention or any other country's intervention in that conflict would help if they were fighting for peace? Because yeah. uh, I guess if it's one thing I've learned, um, it seems like peace is the only option in these conflicts between both sides and accepting that you kind of have to move on. Yeah. Well, first off, peace isn't ever the only option in the moment, but in the end, peace is the only, it's where it ends up. All, every conflict leads to peace. It, every conflict is over at some level. And it may lead to peace, meaning one, one group is really, another group uh, it defines the context of power, and the other group has to live with that, you know? But in the end, there's, the conflict goes away. 
So in Israel, in Palestine, the conflict will go away at some point. It, of course it will. They, they've not been fighting for 2,000 years. If you, have, when you hear, if you hear people say, oh, those people have been fighting over there forever. No, they haven't. They have not. Nor have they been fighting in Afghanistan forever. And, and so that's not how it is. So peace will come. And so that's the first important thing to say. The second thing that I want to say is that, you know, the problem with anybody intervening Wherever we intervene, there's, if, if you intervene, you, there's something that you, the likelihood that there's something that you have, that you're going to gain from your intervention is very high or else you wouldn't intervene. You know, you, you, it might be like kind of the, even like now in Haiti, you know, they're, we're trying to get the, the Kenyan troops or now really the Kenyan police forces to go to Haiti and be a police force in Haiti and calm things out a little bit and the UN is working with the government in Kenya and so on. Kenya has made a U-turn on Haiti. After agreeing to deploy troops to the violent stricken nation, Kenyan President William Ruto's government has now halted the move. Meanwhile, armed gangs led by Jimmy Chirizie continue their rampage with no replacement in sight for Prime Minister Ario Henry. But there's something to gain from that, right? There always has to be. So you have to be always really kind of careful about like, well, what are people gonna get out of it? So this is like with the United States, right? We're not not like the, people have this idea, many Americans do, that, oh, the US is just this country that we do good for the world. It's like, really, really? Are you, have, you, have, you read the, have you read the history? Are you reading the history? We do some good, we do a lot of good, but we do a lot of really pretty bad things. So my question to you is sort of regarding, like it, they, it was touched upon in like the article about like a the Korean adoption thing. Um, I guess it regards like loneliness uh-huh. in a sense, like seeing the loneliness is like such like a, I think people are paying more attention to how like detrimental of an impact it has on people's lives. But in an era like with social media and how rampant that is and how easy it is co- to connect to one another, how do you, what are your thoughts on like loneliness being such an epidemic with that and can social media do anything to change that? Wow. Dude, that's a really interesting question. Uh, because the irony is that we're more connected today than we ever have been in, in, at any point in human history, right? And yet there's some sense of it, the connections that we have aren't necessarily enough for us, which is like what we saw in COVID, right? You all remember what COVID was like? I mean, oh, what a better thing. The school is closed down. You don't have to go to school. You get to stay home. Most of your schools can't figure out how to teach online, so most of the time you're just playing video games or whatever you want to do. And like, you know, you got this freedom. Like, oh my God, what could be better for any kid than that? And yet, it's lonely, it's difficult. And, and I think that we haven't figured out, as a species, as a people, we haven't figured out how to organize our lives sociologically to get past that. So I don't know, I think we will eventually, or we'll just go off the deep end as a society. Uh, do you think your generation owes our generation an apology, or <laughs> vice versa? Oh, For what? Wait, for what? For what, li, what are the t- top three things for which okay. we owe you an apology? Um, I can think of about 30, but give me th- your top three. The housing crisis. Okay. Uh, a lot of our parents' lack of emotional uh, capacity while we were raised. Yeah. Um, and technology feeding us too, so, too much social media or, or tech or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's really not about you all. You all are just consuming, right? <laughs> This really, to a great degree, started in the 80s when we just deregulated. We just said, let's just let people live how they want to live and let businesses be businesses in the way they want to do that. Let's educate the way people want to educate. Just let let people go. It's a free-for-all, right? I mean, much more like that. This is really the very beginning of the 80s, of like the Reagan years, so to speak, right? but we didn't, no one knew that these, they, it's like a very slow process of unfolding. They, you don't realize the implications of that until you get there. So all three things that you said really stem from that, st- including the housing crisis, including jobs and the, the, the polarization of rich and poor and jobs going around the world. So here, this generation, but you know, we made, 
we cut global poverty by 70% because we took the money that would be going to you all and we shared it with, we, meaning the world, shared it with people in other nations that didn't have access to that money. So in that sense, it's like, yeah. So you see, it's a really complex thing. But, but all in all, like, yeah, the boomer world, like you guys have this thing about boomers. I'm, mind you, I'm barely a boomer. I was born in 1960, so technically I'm just a, on the cusp of it. But yeah, I think in a way we owe you an apology.